All right. Hi, everyone, and uh, welcome to Silo AI's last webinar of this year uh, with the topic of situational awareness with computer vision. Uh, today, we have a stellar board of speakers, so to say. Um, first of all, my name is Paulina Alanen. I'm the comms and marketing lead here at Silo AI, and I have the honor to have as our guest uh, Svante Hendrickson, who is the CEO and co-founder of Hurricane Unwinder. Hi, everyone. Yes, then we have Nico Wokko, our lead AI solution architect, uh, who will actually start off. And then uh, our last speaker, but definitely not the least, is uh, Nico Holmberg, who is our AI scientist at Silo AI, specializing in computer vision. Hi there. Hi, everyone. All right, so let's get uh, into our agenda today. So, uh, as said, the topic is situational awareness with computer vision. And to start off, uh, Nico Vuokko will talk about machine sensing in the age of computer vision. So, um, he will talk about what is modern computer vision and um, what is now happening as computer vision is entering into critical use cases and then what does that mean uh, technology-wise. Uh, after that, uh, our guest Svante Hendrickson will take the floor uh, with the topic of AI enabling generation, uh, next generation weather data. Um, Svante um, has a long, let's say, research background as a climate researcher, and uh, he has founded Hur Hurricane Unwinder and will also tell a little bit about the company. Uh, Svante has researched hurricanes and the reasons behind the formation of very strong winds at the Finnish Meteorological Institute for uh, five years. And then the final topic, um, led by our AI scientist, Nico Holmberg, he will dive deeper into um, the case of predicting uh, the intensity of tropical storms such as hurricanes or other types of typhoons uh, based on satellite image data. And Nico, Nico has been working uh, extensively with Hurricane Unwinder, for instance, to build this capability for them. Um, then in the end, after all the three speeches are are over, uh, we would like to open the floor for you. So throughout these presentations, we hope that you use in the GoToWebinar, you have this question uh, feature where you can ask uh, questions and I will be taking these questions um, throughout the presentations and then we'll all try to answer as many of those as we can in the end. So please um, either write it in the questions feature or then you can also raise your hand and I'll do my best to give you the open mic then in the end. All right, so let's get right into it then and have our next speaker. So Nico Vuokko, I'll uh, give you the presentation right here. Sure. Right, so I suppose you can see the agenda now. Yeah. Is that, yes, okay, good. Yeah, so maybe getting uh, briefly started simply, um, uh, simply with the uh, overview of uh, what our company is, is, uh, is about. So Silo AI is now a bit over three years old and uh, we are now already the largest uh, private AI lab in the Nordics. And, and then naturally our targets now next is definitely to broaden our uh, reach uh, across the Europe, something that we've already started with, uh, with our first international offices. 
so right now, in, in terms of size, we're already 100 plus AI experts in house, and, and we've really focused on on finding a lot of really, really strong PhD talent in AI uh, to the company, simply because AI as a technology is moving forward really, really fast. And uh, having uh, experience from a few years past simply isn't enough because the novel technology simply from the last six months is, is far superior for, to, to anything that is there in the past. So as we've grown, um, we've expanded our reach also in terms of technology. So uh, whereas we started from really uh, providing uh, strong expertise in AI modeling uh, uh, as such alone, then over time we've expanded our, our reach then, uh, to, to providing end-to-end uh, -end solutions. So when it comes to understanding the, the, the sensors, the data processing, the other software needed by, by intelligence solutions, then nowadays we can offer it those solutions end-to-end -to -end, uh, uh, quite solidly. So then uh, looking into uh, how we generally work. So uh, as I mentioned, we are a services company. So we are providing services and solutions to our customers and uh, really providing state-of-the-art AI expertise for both accelerating work of uh, internal R&D teams at our customers and uh, also for end-to-end -end turnkey uh, solution delivery. So uh, as, as we usually work, we are extremely flexible in terms of customer needs and uh, often, often constantly are changing the expert profiles and team setups and uh, project timelines as, as the overall needs uh, arise and re really focusing on building a strong development partnership, not only in terms of uh, providing technology, but also providing overall um, AI advisory to our customers. So then uh, on, the, uh, on the right side over here, um, uh, as part of our service, we can actually also often offer uh, pre-built and, and production proving, uh, proven AI components that can then be used as part of the overall AI solution and uh, development work. So, so uh, what this means is uh, naturally that is uh, speeding up work and also prove, using proven components uh, improves uh, predictability of, of the development and, uh, and also uh, the project timelines. Then, uh, well, why silo AI? Since, uh, since naturally there's a lot of uh, different uh, service uh, service o offers uh, in the market, but the, the specific things uh, where we really differ is, is our focus in, into a few of these things uh, shown here. So first of all, we've all, always really focused on building a long-term partnership. So it's, it's not just about uh, writing a bunch of code and, and then uh, handing it over and uh, letting others deal with the rest, but, but really uh, taking all parts of the development journey under the partnership simply because AI is a, is a novel technology. And uh, being good at the technology is, is only part of the uh, formula. So, so another important formula is simply building the trust and understanding that where should you actually be using AI? How should you using, be using AI? How can you actually make an impact to your own business? Uh, with AI. So it's it's this sort of holistic viewpoint that we've been always focusing on. Um, uh, the other, uh, uh, another aspect is, is um, uh, the overall uh, really, really strong expertise that we have in-house. So we've pay, always paid specific attention to, to how to really have the best expertise available for all kinds of different AI work needed. And uh, that doesn't only mean hiring PhDs uh, in, in plentiful uh, amounts, but also uh, making sure that uh, everyone's skills are always staying up to, up to date. So when, when there's like a highly uh, fast progressing field as AI in question, then uh, being good, being great is actually much more about staying great. So, so that's, that's another side we, we focus on strongly. 
And, and finally, then, uh, since we've already worked on 100 plus AI projects uh, over time and taken those into production successfully, then uh, we've also accumulated this uh, silo operating software um, components and uh, tools and solutions that can, we, we can use uh, in, in follow up projects to simply speed, speed them up and reduce risks in those uh, development work. So that's about the um, overall picture of the company. And then perhaps uh, more to the um, actual uh, topic of the day, which is about modern computer vision and uh, what is it actually about? So, so naturally a lot of people, they get their uh, understanding of what computer vision can nowadays do uh, from the media. And as you know, media is always uh, sort of a um, mixed, mixed truth of, of uh, exaggerated hype and, and something that is already production proven and, and taken into use uh, more broadly. So it's, is the computer vision nowadays, is it just about like classifying cats in, in nice demos or, or then alternatively uh, autonomous cars or what else can it actually be? So uh, the hope was to sort of a bring kind of a tour through of where modern computer vision is effectively used, how the technology has, has progressed and uh, also to kind of give a glimpse that as the technology has going forward, then it also means that there's additional demands uh, to, for example, reliability of the technology, since the use cases are becoming more and more critical, um, uh, even for the, uh, uh, the scale of the whole society. So looking first on the, on, on the different types of, of sensing, uh, what can be achieved. So naturally, often when you consider computer vision, it's, it's a question that, okay, this is a, a fixed camera taking pictures, or perhaps uh, it's, it's a video camera taking a continuous feed of, of action in front of you. Uh, but actually computer vision uh, technology can be used for, for bringing intelligence to a very, very wide range of, of different problems and different, different senses. So for example, in, in many um, industrial situations um, um, where there's a, a high throughput uh, uh, in a factory, uh, for example, in a conveyor belt, there's fast moving objects. It requires very, very high frame rates. For, for example, taking more than several hundred pictures every single second uh, to, to keep up uh, with, with the action in, in the factory. And uh, modern AI technologies have really uh, become really, really reliable also in terms of this uh, kind of throughput and also latency. For example, in a factory, there might be a control point a few meters away from the, from the sensors and uh, whatever the AI is doing, it needs to actually produce its predictions and opinions of, of the object, objects before the object actually hits the control point where the object needs to be uh, then uh, transferred to the right follow on and conveyor. Then uh, in, in another sense, considering uh, the size of uh, individual images. So instead of just the re regular, let's say 10 megapixel pictures, uh, for, for example, in pathology and also actually in many other fields as well, uh, you might encounter extremely large images reaching trillions of pixels uh, per image. And uh, there, the question is then really, how can you actually combine all the little tiny details that matter when you zoom in deep and deep and deep into the image? How do you tie the, all those details together into a broader context of the image to understand what is the, what is the general truth? And naturally, this, this brings uh, quite a bit of limitations in terms of uh, technology, but this is something that is, is already uh, quite uh, far behind in terms of, uh, of a challenge for, for new novel uh, AI technologies. Then a bit of a different kind of an example. So um, whenever you are actually taking uh, uh, pictures with your phone uh, nowadays or, or videos, whichever it might be, then uh, the the camera is actually never taking just a single picture, but it's silently taking multiple ones. And nowadays, if you look at your camera, uh, your mobile phone, it probably has multiple cameras next to each other. And when you're taking a photo, it's actually 
taking multiple photos from all of those different cameras at the same time. And uh, those, uh, that technology is basically meant for feeding all of that data uh, through AI methods to uh, get rid of the sort of limitations that physics gives us, like how accurate, how precise, what uh, can a photo be from a camera that is as small as a, as a mo modern mobile phone can uh, contain. So AI technology is there for, for bringing stabilization, fixing blur, fixing lighting, uh, bringing far, far better level of detail than was ever even possible with any physics-based uh, uh, single photos. So this is sort of a AI bypassing the limitations of, of what is actually possible uh, in, in the sphere of, let's say, traditional technology. Then the final uh, example here of, of satellite data is, is uh, yet another example uh, where actually how AI is often used uh, in, in terms of satellite data, it's, it's not for just standard data, standard imagery, but even more so it's, it's about multi-spectral data for agriculture, infrared data for area monitoring, uh, synthetic radar data for seeing through clouds, seeing depth, seeing heights of objects on the ground, or, or for example, just uh, taking seismic data to see below the ground, something that is, isn't is even radiation anymore. It's just data that can be interpreted as a 2D image uh, or even a 3D image. So so the um, breadth of what, what modern computer vision can do, it's, it's, it's uh, far broader than uh, perhaps it ever was with more traditional methods. Then uh, on to the um, other selection of examples on, on, okay, that is the question of if you have a single sensor, what can you do? But then it's a question, okay, what if you have multiple different sensors? Is there something even better that can be achieved? And, and there's also uh, uh, quite a broad range of, of different use cases that have uh, arisen uh, over time for, for specifically something that AI has enabled something that wasn't really possible previously. So one thing, for example, is, is fully automatic awareness uh, across a large area, uh, for example, in shopping center for ports for, for train yards, so that the technology itself automatically understands what's going on all of, over the place and combines data from multiple different cameras that are in multiple different place, uh, places and angles all together to understand which are the common objects in, in, in different cameras and, and having this common awareness fully automatically. Another one is uh, if there's a large object that needs to be analyzed from multiple different angles and combined into one single analysis, for example, analyzing uh, large power lines, mobile station power lines, or even just objects on a manufacturing line where you need to have multiple angles to the same objects, then this is something that is, is rather simple to be achieved actually with, with modern technology where instead of like rather grievous uh, manual coding uh, that needs to be then updated once in a while and, and rather often actually, you simply feed the data to, to AI methods and they will automatically uh, produce this uh, overall understanding of, of of the quality and situation of the object. Uh, the third example is uh, here's a, a combination uh, view of what, what what you can have in when combining lighter data, so laser laser uh, laser data and uh, uh, photo data together. Uh, something that is, of course, uh, as you probably know, quite common nowadays with autonomous car technology. And the idea naturally there is that when you have different kinds of sensors, then those different sensors have very, very different strengths and different weaknesses. And those sensors have a better fit for different needs. So the point of the AI-based sensor fusion is to make it really simple to combine the best sides of these different sensors so that yeah, as an outcome, you have this superior fusion sensor available that can produce far better data uh, for intelligent solutions than any single sensor 
uh, alone uh, could. So this is something that goes perhaps already far, far beyond also of, of what is the traditional AI methods in computer vision being. And, uh, and while it's already uh, in use, in production use, in lots and lots of different uh, use cases, it nevertheless, there's no like uh, fixed manual on how to actually bring sensor fusion in, in place. And it, it requires quite a bit of specific expertise to, to, to really uh, leverage those possibilities. Then the final example here is, is, a, is a rather different kind of a uh, example uh, where we're actually combining imagery uh, with text. So instead of uh, understanding user behavior, for example, in online shopping, not just basing it on the color of the clothes, the sizes, or, or the time of day when it's been used, but what if you can actually understand the user behavior also based on what the images contain, what the textual description contains, what helps sales and user experience to be better? Is it to have the description long or short, funny or formal? Uh, uh, at which order should you have these different uh, uh, descriptions uh, for the products? Should the image be from the side or the front? How many of them you should have? Uh, with AI, you can actually fuse these different types of data together as well to, to bring in a, a joint optimization across these different features. So then, uh, so this has been sort of a example of a lot of these different uh, uh, new kinds of data, whether it's for new kinds of sensors or, or new ways, uh, new ways to combine the capabilities of data types and sensors that have been enabled with modern computer vision. Uh, but as time goes by, and as computer vision enters these more critical use cases, then the question is, what are the consequences um, that as any technology ever uh, becomes more critical uh, uh, for, for, for the society and for all of us, there comes additional needs that the technology needs to fulfill so that it's it's actually something we wish to take into production and reliably use. So those are something that you can maybe uh, put into two different categories, one for technical guarantees and the other one for societal guarantees. So on the technical side, there's these questions that are already hitting uh, the news uh, quite a lot. For example, safety in corner cases. Can we actually trust that the AI solution doesn't do something catastrophically stupid uh, in the case of corner cases? How do you secure it against uh, that happening? How does the AI solution behave when there's an actual hostile adversary pre present that is trying to make this solution work wrong and, and produce something uh, even safety critical uh, uh, for people uh, around, around the, the solution. Uh, and the third one is understanding what has actually happened and, and being able to go back and audit the behavior of, of AI uh, and uh, realize where it went wrong and uh, where did it behave uh, the way it sh should. On the societal level, as, as uh, AI is taking more and more uh, also media presence, there's naturally this discussion of what is the license to operate AI solutions. And, and the key questions there are often like the human agency, the humans be, should be there in control and uh, in un understanding how they are being treated by, by the AI and how does AI behave around them. Another question is, is naturally uh, to privacy. What are the specific uh, ways uh, you can guarantee privacy in uh, AI solutions. And, uh, uh, and that is, of course, linked quite a bit to the ethics side, that how can you actually be sure that when AI is making complex decisions, that is actually fair and not discriminating silently um, in this sort of like uh, uh, silent bias uh, way against, this, for example, a specific group of people. So these are the things that are, are like increasingly coming up also in the project that we are now now working on, and it's they are actually surprisingly hairy and and complex. Something that is is not really uh, part of the experience of of more traditional software technologies, but specific problems 
for, for AI that takes specific AI-based uh, approaches. So finally, as a, as a um, takeaway uh, of this all, uh, so uh, perhaps as a, as a nice uh, hint to, towards the overall topic, so AI-based computer vision is definitely taking the world by storm. So it's, it's not just something that uh, is used, to, used for demos, but uh, AI computer vision is something that is constantly being taken into highly critical use cases all over the place. And that is also what we are uh, working on on daily for very wide variety of different use cases. The other thing is that the technology itself is advancing still really, really rapidly. And, um, and uh, we do have like constant examples uh, where, uh, where simply considering the technology choices for specific projects, then uh, a technology that is one year old might be horribly outdated and we can produce far uh, far improved business outcomes but by, by simply using what is what is the latest available. Uh, another question comes into this broader question of, of how do you may put the AI as part of an overall uh, solution? It's not just about AI, but it's also about com common design for also sensors and data processing. Since AI is setting the requirements for the overall solution, and that means that often actually you need the AI expertise also when making this, uh, this overall uh, design all the way from the sensors through the data stack to the, to the models themselves. And this is also followed up not only in development, but also how to actually operate this thing when uh, uh, silent failures in AI is something that are extremely hard to detect by, by traditional IT operations, monitoring uh, means and methods. And the final point is, is, is this question of uh, responsibility uh, when it comes to more and more critical use cases for uh, modern uh, computer vision. Uh, these things actually take a lo lot of effort at something that we've already experienced and, uh, and have, have spent quite a bit of effort to, to get better at it. And, and this is something that really needs to be taken rather seriously when, uh, when, when starting to deploy these sorts of uh, solutions. So that's pretty much uh, what I had uh, in mind to show. So perhaps the next next point is to go to uh, Svante and uh, his uh, specifics on, on uh, weather forecasting. Okay. Uh, thanks. Uh, thanks, Nico. And it was really really interesting and stimulating to listen to your presentation. I actually got, got a few ideas how, how we could implement some of these lessons you've, you've taken from, from other, other fields of work into, into our uh, development as well. So, so yeah, I'm Svante from uh, Hurricane and Winder. Uh, we do next generation weather data. So we're responding to the needs of society uh, that is becoming increasingly sensitive to different weather events. Uh, extreme weather and also also normal weather uh, and seasonal variations that all are becoming more unpredictable and stronger due to, to climate change at the moment and as well the, the systems, uh, logistics and, uh, and, and such uh, are more weather sensitive, they're highly uh, effectivized and, and more sensitive to small disturbances and, and such. So we have uh, we have both software uh, solutions and in particular the, the tropical storm monitoring and, and forecasting platform uh, that Paulina mentioned and that uh, our AI scientist from Silo Nico Holmberg is going to speak about in more detail after me and then we have hardware as well so we have the world's lightest weather sensor developed or world's lightest weather sonde actually. Uh, so, our, the, what made our company possible is, is this uh, AI technologies and also the fact that components have become uh, smaller in the last few years. So, let's say three to five years ago, what we're doing uh, would not have been possible technologically. Uh, and the, the story of, uh, of our company began roughly in, in 2017. Uh, I had done some research on, on uh, hurricane forecasting uh, 
at the Finnish Meteorological Institute and, and some in, in South Africa, uh, South African Weather Service as well. And in the in autumn 2017, I, I attended uh, the Slush Startup Fair, the Scholar Award uh, competition for, for scientists. And uh, at the same, in around the same time, I also was catching up with uh, with my childhood friend uh, Antti Pasila, who's been a serial entrepreneur and lived in the U.S. for a long time. And both uh, both this slush event and 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 uh, the meeting with Antti showed that there could be uh, actually a lot of uh, of commercial potential in this uh, research that that we had done, uh, which was a surprise to me as as an academic, uh, but. Uh, I caught on caught on to it quite quickly, and uh, got excited about it. So we we got the thing started. We then we won uh, an innovation award called Copernicus Masters. Uh, it's a, it's a competition organized organized by the European Space Agency. 2018, uh, we founded the company in early 2019. We got an investment from from Icebreaker Venture Capital. Uh, we got some pilot users, hired Silo AI, of course, to, to help us uh, deploy the, the newest, uh, most advanced technology. Uh, got some Business Finland grants, and, and we were also um, uh, accepted into the European Space Agency Business Incubation Center. So we got a, got a lot of support from, from, from various uh, sources. And uh, we hired also then uh, very competent uh, engineer for the hardware. So my own background is is in uh, simulations of of weather and climate, and uh, also some running some instrument measurements. But we hired uh, or uh, hired uh, took a third co-founder, let's say uh, Mr. Kim Kaisti, who's actually been designing a lot of weather instruments in the 90s, and he has a very long background in in uh, in uh, commercializing high volume electronics of, of various types. And, and uh, so we started developing the hardware uh, part as well. Uh, and uh, I think this uh, fits nicely into to Finland. You might think, why is there a, a tropical storm forecasting company from Finland? Uh, but uh, if you scratch a little deeper, it, it actually makes a lot of sense. So, so whether research and weather instruments has, has been a very uh, strong part of, of Finnish uh, history for over over a hundred years. Uh, Finnish Meteorological Institute, where I also worked for a long time, is one of the two largest, by far largest, uh, national weather services in Europe. So it's roughly the same size as the UK Met Office. 700 people work there. There's uh, research in, in, in so many uh, different areas, uh, including uh, not just weather, weather and climate, but also space, space science, ocean science, and and many many things that support uh, the development of technology and, and and very high level science in this field. And, and of course, a large industrial company, Vaisala, has uh, has produced the, some of the world's best uh, weather instruments since the 19, 1930s, and they're world leading in 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 the in the industry of, of traditional weather instruments. Uh, so yeah, we we have uh, uh, two two product families. Uh, the I could show you. I actually have here the our hardware setup. So the this is we call this the stream sound. It weighs only about five grams. It measures pressure, relative humidity, temperature, but it also and it, and then the wind based on where it is. So you deploy this from, from a drone or a weather balloon or an aircraft. You can throw it into a tropical storm even, and you measure it. And because it's so light, it doesn't fall through to the ground very quickly, but it can actually almost follow the, the wind trajectories. And it has some novel sensors for, for measuring even the, the small scale turbulence and small vortices. And we can really uh, measure new kinds of structural changes of storms and, and, and bring the, the prediction of storms also together with our satellite light based approach. These two together have the potential to, to, to revolutionize what's going on. So it sends, transmits by this uh, tail here. 
it transmits the data to this uh, this antenna and uh, goes through a, a receiver box and here's also its uh, ground check uh, unit to to wake up the the sonde and check its calibration and and all that so we have a we have a complete sounding system for mainly for for extreme weather but you can also also use it for for any kind of of, of weather measurement so so this is um, something that we're piloting with various uh, national weather services in the world and uh, and uh, some research uh, institute and, and storm measurers and then if you paulina can click to the next slide and here's a, here's a screenshot of of the app that we're uh, now demonstrating with with some pilot users for for tropical storm forecasting uh, and this this shows now a historical storm from from this uh, season teddy and on the lower left in the lower lower left corner you can see the estimate that our algorithms have given and these are so called now now cast estimates so we are completing the data with satellite based image uh, recognition it's a technology that's uh, very closely related to the one in the previous presentation where you classified cats and uh, no cats but uh, it's more complicated as well that for forecasting uh, weather we are integrating this with uh, traditional weather forecasting technology so we haven't uh, let's say completely overhauled the, the weather forecasting but what we're actually doing is we're taking the newest satellite images that come every 10 minutes or so and we are updating improving the the forecast that uh, government agencies around the world are providing for free for some select customers um, and our our pilot customers are are in two categories one is the reinsurance industry there's uh, hurricanes produce an average of, of 30 billion euros of, of damages every year and it's going up by by a lot with climate change so for example 2017 was record-breaking it was 200 billion uh, uh, dollars of, of damages or over in in the US alone so so there's uh, a lot of uh, a lot, lot at stake and uh, the insurance industry is also moving into more real-time operations so they can actually do trading of of insurances and do risk hedging with derivatives and, and various uh, instruments in the in the in the market let's say over the counter markets with with hedge funds and, and so on this is one one segment and the other one is uh, is in disaster management so so we're uh, piloting this with with some government agencies for for some more updated information uh, to to produce the best possible disaster response and our <clears throat> specialty is in the forecasting of intensity and uh, that's because we can see the internal structure of these storms now better with uh, with the all the large data in in a satellite image it has uh, can have a hundred times more pixels than a normal weather forecast that's based on a, on a physics simulation so so when you see the internal structure and how it's changing in the satellite image better the intensity forecast becomes more accurate uh, whereas the path uh, is is more determined by the, let's say the large uh, scale state of the atmosphere which also of course has its own uh, own machine learning applications but we're fo our our main focus in this product is on the on the intensity and the intensity has been a traditionally very weak link in in weather forecasting so uh it, it it's poorly poorly uh, forecasted for example those storms in 2017 that we read a lot about uh, they often underwent so-called rapid intensification surprisingly and uh, when a hurricane goes up one category on the five point scale the damage expected damages go up uh, five or six fold so two categories is uh, is about 30 times more expected damage and that means that the response really needs to to respond to this and uh, it's not always possible to to deploy the the response based on on the maximum possible outcome because it's very impractical and expensive so this kind of solutions uh, 
are in high demand at, at the moment. But yeah, that's that's my presentation, and I'd like to hand it over to to Nico Holmberg. I thank you, Svante. Let me just. Uh start sharing my screen which you should all be seeing right now so let me start off by giving giving like a very brief introduction to to satellite uh, imaging as it pertains to to monitoring uh, tropical storms so globally there are actually a, a number of satellites that are are dedicated to this task so uh, some of these are, are so-called uh, geostationary satellites which are uh, essentially located in, in fixed points above uh, the major oceans where, where tropical storms typically occur. And, and these, these satellites are equipped with uh, sensors that are, can capture high resolution images of the Earth below uh, using uh, various wavelengths of light in order to actually probe different kinds of atmospheric features. So here on, on the top right, uh, I have two example images taken of, of Typhoon Haitian from, from this season. So on, on the left side, we have a, a normal visible light image of, of the storm. And then on the right, we have the corresponding infrared image of, of the same storm, which has been colored uh, based on the uh, measured infrared temperature to uh, kind of better visualize the uh, variations in the cloud height. So what can these types of uh, satellite images tell us about the intensity of the storm? Well, to better answer that question, let me show you a short video clip of, of Hurricane Irma as it uh, moved through the uh, Caribbean islands and ultimately made landfall in Florida. Uh, while the video clip is playing, uh, please pay close attention to the uh, shape of the cloud layer because there are some interesting features that I'd like to point out. Uh, in the middle of the storm, you'll start to see a kind of black circle forming. Uh, this is the so-called eye of the hurricane, which, which is very uh, pronounced visible in, in the black and white infrared images. As the storm approaches Cuba here and, and Florida to the north, you'll see that the uh, eye actually uh, disappears from sight, so it, it's becoming less and less visible until at the end of the clip, you can no longer see it at all. And these uh, kind of uh, visual changes in, in the appearance of, of the storm actually have a, a, like direct correspondence uh, in the intensity of the storm. So when when the uh, eye was uh, hurricane's eye was was clearly visible, that's when the hurricane was at peak intensity. So it was a very strong Category Five hurricane at that time. And when it uh, hit hit Cuba and Florida, uh, and the eye eye disappeared that's when also the, the kind of wind speeds started decreasing. And this, this idea of actually using, using kind of the, this kind of visual information to, to estimate a tropical storm intensities is, is actually a rather old idea. So traditionally what, what has been used is, is kind of a rule-based system where uh, using a kind of a, a pattern analysis method, you classify the storm in, into specific categories. And based on that, you can derive an estimate of the, the uh, storm's intensity. Uh, what we are building uh, together with, with Hurricane Einwander is actually a kind of deep learning based replacement for, for this rule-based rule approach. So in practice, what we're doing is we're training models on, on historical data, uh, which take in as inputs uh, these types of satellite images and based on that uh, produce like a direct estimate of, of the uh, tropical storm's current intensity. And, and with these kinds of systems, you can uh, reach very competitive performance uh, as long as you kind of take in, into account a, a number of practical challenges uh, that arise when, when you uh, start, start to kind of uh, deploy the system in, in, into production use. So I've listed some of the challenges here. Uh, the one that I want to talk about in, in more detail is this last one. So uh, how do we uh, consider kind of a uh, how do we uh, model phenomena that are not directly visible uh, based on, on satellite images alone? So one, one concrete example is, of this is, is the effect of sea surface temperature. Uh, like as a general rule of thumb, when, when storms move over warm water, they gain strength. And when they hit 
uh, hit land and, and traverse over ground, they lose strength as, as you saw from, from the video clip earlier. Now, looking at the satellite images, we can only see like indirectly this phenomenon. So we see the storm weakening, but we can't explain uh, what caused that weakening because the satellite images don't have that information. If we want to, our model to, to give us that explanation, we, we uh, have to encode that information in, in some other way. Here, like the, the simple solution is actually uh, giving, giving a, or defining another uh, input to the model. So in addition to the satellite images, we can uh, build out a sea surface temperature maps, which are again, uh, an image-like uh, image -like, uh, data stream. And, and with that, we can kind of uh, uh, also teach the model to, to uh, consider that kind of information. This is actually, this, this, this example is, is, is a good kind of a, uh, transition to, to the uh, final topic that I wanted to discuss in my presentation, which is how do we now go, go from actually uh, like uh, now casting, so, so from estimating like the current uh, intensity of the storm to actual uh, longer term forecasts. So you could of course, uh, in principle take say a sequence of, of satellite images and, and feed them through some kind of uh, time series model to, to create uh, wind speed predictions into the future. However, as, as, as alluded to in the previous slide, this kind of approach will uh, quickly fail to produce uh, accurate results because there are some, some phenomena that, that the satellite images cannot capture at all. Uh, that's why you, you really need to, to uh, consider also alternative data sources. So this could mean uh, some other satellite-based products or, or something else. So for example, uh, one, one very interesting one is actually uh, numerical weather data, meaning uh, physics-based simulations and the outcomes, outcomes from that, because it's, uh, it, it contains uh, very complementary data to, to satellite images. Uh, as, as a data structure, this is of course no longer an, an image, but instead it's it's a kind of a, uh, data that is defined on on a on a, a global grid that not only kind of spans the, the latitude and longitude coordinates, but also contains uh, a third dimension, which is this uh, this elevation direction. And uh, and and to me, as as an AI scientist, this this really has been like the the kind of most uh, most uh, interesting challenge. Uh, in, in this process project. So how do we kind of uh, build out uh, on the kind of model architecture level, all of the components to, to actually, uh, first of all, uh, first of all, kind of process each of these individual stream data streams. And then at, at the next step, uh, start fusing these, these data uh, sources together to build out a forecasting model that can accurately uh, predict what will be the wind speed in, in say 24 hours into the future. Now, uh, as kind of a second point that I wanted to highlight here is 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 actually uh, related to kind of data pipelining. So uh, usually, if if you're coming from from academia, you're you're kind of used to working with with uh, clean data sets and and you have kind of pre-made scripts scripts to to kind of uh, handle the data, but but here I think one very interesting challenge is also kind of this engineering work needed to to actually uh, build out the tools that, that you, you can kind of process the data and then use it for for training and then uh, finally uh, at the end end uh, use it in actual production use. So I think uh, this this is uh, this has been kind of really interesting project for me and and this ties back well well to the kind of uh, uh, comments that, that both Svante and, and, and Nico made about kind of multimodality in, in computer vision. So computer vision is, is not just uh, analyzing images and, and video, it's, it's much more than that. And, and I think uh, there's kind of like techniques that, that although it is kind of could be classified as, as, as a technique that's meant only for one like specific uh, machine learning uh, use case, it's, it can find find uses also in 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 in, in sectors that that could be considered like purely computer vision or some, something else. So I think uh, this is especially in, in this project. I think those kind of uh, the 
challenges with, with multimodality and and, uh, and uh, different types of data sources that kind of like has been very uh, eye-opening for me as well. But I think with that, uh, we're kind of running out of time. So I'll, I will hand over the session back to Paulina, who will start the uh, Q&A part of the webinar. Yes, uh, thank you so much, Nico. And of course, Svante and Nico Vuokka as well. So um, we still have about nine minutes to go through some of your questions that you have been sending throughout the presentation. So, so many thanks for those. And if you have any, I, I still have room for some more. Uh, so first of all, there was one question from uh, Jari Ure to Svante. So he says, I have seen a visual storm in news weather forecast as in Studio 3D type. Uh, will you be proceeding in providing some VR or XR type solutions for storm prediction topic in near future? Do you have any interest in that kind of stuff, Svante? Yes, uh, uh, very much. It's in the development pipeline, and thanks. It's a it's a very nice uh, question. So, especially once we once we get these uh, sons deployed, the the hardware deployed into the storms, uh, then we can get a genuinely 3D sweep of it. So satellite images are essentially 2D, uh, and if you want to see what's below the topmost layer of clouds, you have to make some assumptions about it. Uh, that's how those news news uh, uh, VR image images are are produced. So we can replace a lot of that uh, guessing and and uh, ass assuming with with real data. We can launch up to even perhaps even 200 sons at the time in, into a storm and get a really nice nice 3D image. Uh, have you been, it was very nice to see you like uh, show this physical sound that you have been building, the, the small one. Um, how have you used it so far in practice or is it still mostly in the like R&D phase? No, it's it's been deployed in, in, in practice in, in pilot, uh, pilot cases and in our internal tests. We've done uh, drone drops and, and such. Mainly, mainly drone drops and, and of course like surface, just normal laboratory validation and, and validation against standard weather stations. But yes, the, the drone drops already show, show quite a lot of interesting phenomena. Uh, what, the more you actually explore weather, the more complicated you, you realize that it is. So in the, in the, just like out here, probably there's something very interesting happening right now, even though it just looks miserable. Yeah, it sure does. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I also got a reply from the audience who asked this question originally that, wow, and with Barrio goggles uh, in the future, it'll be amazing. So thanks for that uh, response, Svante. And um, actually, I have another question for you as well. So. Sebastian Haglund is asking, is it possible to forecast wind speed even without hurricane images, for example, overland in Europe? Hmm. Yes. Even uh, without hurricane images. Yes, sure. Like uh, there haven't always been weather satellites and yeah. well, well, computer weather, there were weather forecast models even before computers, but the problem was that it was slower to calculate them than what the weather evolved faster than the calculation. So you got like tomorrow's forecast the day after tomorrow. Uh, those were those predate even the computers predated the weather satellites that been around since the 60s. But like the weather forecasts take a lot of data into consideration, ground-based stations and these uh, radio sons from, from Finnish company Vaisala have been around since the 30s. Uh, so, so weather Weather forecasting is very multimodal, uh, like, like Nico just said, and you can use all this data for, for, for forecasting. And depends on how good your data is, how, how many points you have, how, how accurate the forecast then becomes. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. 
Um, okay, I'm getting many questions, um, trying to stay in the loop here. For Nico Vuokko, um, you had um, some interesting computer vision cases, perhaps some more like uh, personal, so if you could tell some like concrete um, like example of a project that you have been involved in um, at, at Silo AI, like some, some kind of um, concrete example where you have been involved, like what, what was it that you were uh, trying to solve? Right. Uh, I've personally been uh, quite a bit involved with, uh, let's say, more industrial customers, although been working with a bunch of others as well, uh, but that's perhaps where, where the key expertise has been. So I think there's there's been plenty of cases, for example, where it, it's about process and quality improvement in, in factories, uh, uh, understanding problems in processes, understanding quality issues in, in products, and uh, then producing uh, real-time control to, to fix uh, fix those issues, and then also for, for, for long-term quality improvement processes. Uh, then perhaps a bit of a different kind has, has been um, Cases involved in in mining actually, uh, where we've done uh, uh, a rather broad selection of different projects, whether it's uh, open pit or underground mines, whether it's it's optimization of of um, rock processing uh, in, in the underground by by drills, uh, in optimized control, whether it's uh, safety features with AI in the in the mines. So, so there's been there's been a lot of those. Yeah, thank you, Nico. Um, then I have a question which is mostly for um, Nico Holmberg, but also to Swante, I would say. So uh, could you comment on handling long tail scenarios where the model weather performance is likely unreliable? And additionally, if you could comment on how you combine images with other data sources. Uh, sure. So, so the first question is is actually a good good uh, good question. We kind of uh, there's definitely still still some some work to be done there because, uh, uh, for instance, uh, there was a kind of surprising situation this this season when one of the kind of satellites was uh, returning sort of like corrupted data and, and and that kind of threw off the predictions because it, it was kind of scenario that that wasn't anticipated so there's kind of definitely uh lots of ed edge cases uh to kind of handle there but uh our, our product is of course n uh still in in kind of uh development phase and is, is not used to, uh, as part of like uh any kind of official warning system so so those those concerns uh are something that uh that, that our system doesn't have to be kind of uh fully fully uh, fail fail failure proof in that regard and then uh to to kind of briefly answer the second question which is actually a very complicated one uh, i think there there is kind of a uh kind of one one approach is is, is kind of like tre first treating treating all of the the data sources more or less kind of independent ones uh, so kind of a, uh first having some kind of a a model that that processes the individual streams so so it could mean for example our our uh, uh, satellite image now casting models so those can be used as kind of like a feature extraction pipeline which at, at a later stage could then be fused fused together uh with with the other data sources but that's maybe kind of like uh i would say kind of late fusion model but but i i'd say that it's also wor worth exploring uh Kind of alternative strategies where where the fusion happens much earlier in the pipeline, but that that of course is is, is then uh, more more difficult to to build out in in practice. So there's kind of lo lots of experimentation that that can be done on on that end to to find kind of the best best approach. Yeah, thank you, Nico. Um... Yeah, I think we're running out of time here, so maybe we can jump to the la last slide. Just one question I will answer here very briefly. I got it from 
uh, Petri, so you asked how much do you do annotation of images and uh, yes we do that quite a bit. Uh, we actually have uh, our own customizable productized solution uh, which we call the Silo OS annotator to, for this purpose. And uh, if you Petri or anyone else would have any more questions regarding that or something else you may get in touch with uh, myself or Nico Buokka after this. So now it's time to thank you all uh, for joining this final webinar of this year and a big huge thank you also to Svante, our guest from Hurricane Unwinder, Nico Buokka and Nico Holmberg for, for the wonderful presentations you gave and um, I'm receiving many thanks also from, from the audience so we sure enjoyed all, your, all of your parts. And um, this is a series of webinars that we're doing, so if you're interested in seeing some more of those, you may browse to silo AI slash webinars. And uh, we'll be also sending you all the recording of today's webinar uh, together with our contact info, should you have any further questions. But thank you very much and happy holidays. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks.